never out. Um, uh, you know, and he doesn't go to doctors. He won't. I've got some religious thing. He doesn't go to doctors. So when he does get sick, like last week, he had the flu. He just went through it. And he looked green on the stage, but he went through it. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think we're Michael. Michael. Uh, Michael. Uh, oh, they just got McGrath. Lives. Michael McGrath stopped. I mean, left because he has to have knee surgery. So that we got in um, Tom McGowan, who's fabulous. Right. Oh, but other than that, everybody's the same, and they're all there. Tom Hardly. Tom McGowan did uh, Wicked for us in London. Right. Yeah, yeah. He and told me. He told me he was doing Wicked. He's really Tom's good. Tom's love for I will. He's really right. good. I really like him. I really um, like him. Greetings, everybody Are we here, and. Coming in from the outside there. Um, my name is John Kilgore, and I'm very happy to have here today as our guests Tony Miola and Paul Gimignani. Tony Miola, sound designer, Paul Gimignani, musical director, par excellence. Um, I have something like nine pages, which includes both of their credits. I, I, I don't know if I can read them all, but I'll, I'll oh, give it a no, shot. No, please don't. I'll come on. Well, Let's see, you want to give us a couple of representative things that you'd like to... Um, the original Lion King and Wicked, right. which is... Um, Off right there. Retired. And, and Best Little Whorehouse. In Best Little Whorehouse goes public. Public, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you're right. And that's Paul, right you want to give us a couple? Um, all of Steve Sondheim's musicals, except for Funny Thing Happened in the Way of the Forum, and a few others. Right. Which I don't remember at the moment. Yeah. Well, you're currently currently I'm doing. She loves me. But right. I did forum, so that makes sense. Yeah, well, it makes the connection. <laughs> um, do you guys remember the first time you you met and worked together? You know, I have to say, I told these guys earlier that I had to look on the Broadway database to know when I met the maestro. He's the only one in the world that I'll use that term with too. I, have to tell you. Um, and we think it was The Rink in 1984, but soon followed by, I mixed for Otz Munderloh, Follies at Avery Fisher Hall, which Paul conducted. And I think we got to know each other really well, really fast, because it was really fast. Yeah, it was. And uh, there were only two performances in a dress rehearsal, and what he had to do was just gargantuan. Um, and I, what Otz had to do, which was... It, Equally gargantuan. What, it, what um, Paul said earlier was it's the first time they did anything like that in Avery Fisher Hall, which it, I hadn't... It was the first musical they ever did with the Philharmonic and, and that space. And the space is probably the sound designer's nightmare. But because um, <clears throat> it, it's just... The acoustics are by themselves without any help are not good. So it, it, it's, uh, it, we've done a lot of weird things in there since, but, but uh, it's not a, not a uh, easy gig. And, uh, and what Tony didn't bring in is, is he was mixing the show per se, and we, as one dress rehearsal, and I mean one dress rehearsal. We didn't even get through it. We didn't get through it in one dress rehearsal because uh, the orchestra, uh, was mis given misinformation, and halfway through the dress rehearsal, I won't say half, three quarters of the way through the dress rehearsal, half of them got up and left because they thought the rehearsal was over. And nobody could talk them into staying because they'd been told the wrong thing. They aren't really that bad of group. They just, you know, they, they, get, uh, they get used in the wrong way and they've protected themselves. Anyway, at the last minute, I mean at the 12th hour, they decide uh, they were going to film it. Do you remember that? Yes. So they, they were only allowed to film four numbers because, like, hello? Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so we hadn't even finished the show. Uh, we actually sight read in front of the audience. When I say haven't finished, I never got through it once because they didn't give us enough time. I now know how to make them, let them give me a schedule up there. I didn't then. But, but uh, we didn't get through it once, so we sight read in front of the audience, I don't know whether you know Follies, but the last 27 minutes is music. We sight read from about uh, the last 15 minutes to the end that we'd never seen before. 
hopefully, thankfully, they're great musicians. <laughs> yes, I remember they changed and decided to film it because every single microphone had to be split to That's the right. truck. That's correct. And of course, there's never any ground loops or anything when you do that. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> but it, was, uh, it was immense, but it was wow. It was so exciting. I, being used to, uh, I come from a musical background. I'm a clarinetist. I started on violin. And, you know, in Broadway, my day, you know, the most strings we ever had, Les Mis at eight, but usually you had four. And to walk in and hear the Philharmonic playing pizzicato to waiting around for the girls, up, waiting, the girls upstairs was just mind-blowing to hear what that's supposed to sound like, not with us trying to make two violins sound like 40. You know, so. <laughs> and whatever anybody says, the New York Philharmonic is one of the greatest orchestras mm -hmm. in the world. That's true. I mean, you hear a lot of odd stories, especially if you work in the industry. And, you know, as, I, as a musician myself, I know exactly what they're doing. They're protecting themselves because you think you guys get used. Yeah. <clears throat> True. True that. But this, this is about collaboration. And um, just what Paul just said, it, that makes him a terrific collaborator, is that he knows what we're doing. And he knows how hard it is to do what we are doing. And it, not necessarily how hard it is, but he knows the limitations. And so he knows to give time when it's needed, and he knows that the trumpets are playing too loud, and he knows that that orchestration is too loud for the vocal that's going to be sung. So those things get cut. Do you know? It's not, it, it, it has changed so much in my tenure as a sound designer, orchestrations, number of people in the pit, and volume, you know? Um, and it's always a pleasure to do a show with Paul because he gets it. He totally gets it. So. Well, I have to say the same thing for Tony because I don't know. I, I will just tell you, if, if I had it up to me, and this is what we do, so he, he won't be surprised. <laughs> I, I'd, I like to get everything set up, and I don't like these three-hour, let's see where we're going to sit in the pit things. I like to have it all done and tell the orchestra, that's where you're sitting, go sit there. And if there's any problems, we'll work it out, but I find it ha takes half the time. And the other thing we do is we do the Zitz probe in the theater, which, which gives the sound guys a, a day up. And all we do is, during the text is we get everything ready, the sound department and me, get everything ready so that all the band has to do is walk in. The, the drum set comes in early, the synthesizers come in early, Anything else that has to go in there, the B3 organ. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I had one in a bit once. Uh, um, uh, two, two shows, actually, Dream Girls and um, Sweeney. Wow. Anyway, um, um, and then we start to play. Now, most guys, they, you know, they test all the mics, make sure everybody's there. You know, you do the 25 minutes on the drums and the one minute on the violin. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> that happens, and then now we're playing with sound. It doesn't happen with him because we talked a long time ago. We start with nothing, and he listens to the room, and I get to hear, and they get to hear themselves without any feedback of any kind. I don't mean actual feedback. I mean nobody's telling them what they're hearing, and then gradually things happen, and what happens is you then end up with the most natural sound possible in the theater, which is, I thought, I thought the idea. You know what I mean? I, mean, I, I assumed that was the idea when you did sound so in the theater. That uh, doesn't always happen, I understand. And I know that a lot of times, me, my job, or your job is not in control suddenly, which is ridiculous, and that's a whole other subject. But the collaboration thing is so important, not only in our jobs, but in all, no, everything in the theater, but, but particularly in our jobs now, since they're putting, I won't do a show that does this, but I don't know what you guys do when you put instruments in different rooms. I, I, I can't get that concept in my head. I won't take a show that does that. If they tell me that the harp is on the fourth floor, then they can get somebody else, because I'm not doing it. They're either in the room that I can look in their face when they're playing, or I'm not, I'm not interested. 54, Studio 54, where she loves me, is to me my ideal house in this day and age. Uh, when we did Assassins there, they wanted to put us off stage. Am I talking too much? No, no. go right uh, ahead. Uh, 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 they wanted to put us off stage, and um, 
I said, no, we're not going off stage. Find another way, we're not going off stage. Well, we could put you in front of the stage. You won't like that. You will not like seeing the band in front of the stage. There's no pit there because when it was built as an opera house, so all the acoustics and everything you think are in an Italian opera house are in that space. So you, you, you so when, when, when the, they did one opera and nobody came, <laughs> they sold the place and it just sat there and then they turned it into cocaine heaven and what the first thing they did was put a big, poured a big slab of cement over the orchestra pit so that they could have that what's now the stage. So I looked around and found these two boxes that were left over from the opera house. There were actually four boxes on, this, on either side of the stage and I said, I can't remember who did sound on that show. Which show? Dan. Assassin. Dan. 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 Dan Schreier. Right. I said, what about if we put the orchestra there? Of course, everybody goes, oh, 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 oh. So we did. And the first sound check was over in 15 minutes because the natural acoustics of the house and the, and the, and the, now Tony and I have done several shows there since, and that's pretty much what happens. We seat the band. We, um, we start to play. We have little, and I, when I say little help from, from, uh, from uh, monitors that play in, play in other side, each, each side. In other words, I hear that, that side and they hear me. Very little is it on. The loudest thing in that setup is my stage speaker because I can't hear when the band's playing. I need to hear the stage a little better than I can hear. Then he starts doing his magic and it's like, we, we end up at the last two things we did together. We, we did about 20 minutes of that because, the, as I said, the orchestra comes in, sits down, takes out their instruments and says, okay, now what? They don't, there's no, you know, I don't, I'm my, my chair, it's none of that because we do it ahead of time. And then about 25 minutes later, we played the score for the next, rest of the three hours and they get all this time to do what they want to do and adjust and make adjustment, microphones adjustments. So by the time we do the Zitz probe, which is the next, the next more, we do a, a, we do a, zitz, a sound check, three hour sound check, and a Zitz probe the same day. By the time we get the Zitz probe, they've had three hours of hearing the orchestra. So now they can leave us alone for a while and play with the voices. So they're ahead of the game. So, but uh, you can't do that with every sound designer. Right. So, uh, as far as I'll go with that. No. <laughs> you can't Sorry. do that with every show. Either. Let me ask you, has this always been your process? I mean, I mean uh, how long have you been doing it this way? Yes and no. I usually, I actually ask for more orchestra time when I'm not working with Paul. Usually we get two mornings of three hours, sometimes three, on a difficult show like Wicked, which the original orchestration has three keyboards, but the tour orchestrations have four. And I originally wanted them to go into one mixer so that they would balance themselves, but I never got my wish. <laughs> so, you know, every, I mean, 13 years later, guess where all the notes are? Right. Keyboard two has this sound, I didn't hear it. Keyboard four has this, you know, so um, that takes, usually on Wicked, we do three hours with just the rhythm section, and then six hours with the orchestra and then go for it. But, right. the, but other, the other thing I just want to throw in here quickly is no earphones in the pit. None. The synthesizer does not put on earphones to play the part. He has speakers that the sound designer picks and he hears himself as a regular instrument. Right. I don't care if it's Dream Girls or Bright Star. Same rules apply. Because then if you, the, once you get a musician listening to himself, and the rest of the people playing around. Now you've got the ideal situation. Right. The minute you 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 uh, what destroy that by either putting them in different rooms, or giving everybody earphones so they can hear the band, they're sitting at the, right. where the band is. You know, that's the dumbest excuse I've ever heard. That's <laughs> I went through this in Dreamgirls, where you know, not the sound designer, but the musician said, "Well, I need earphones for what?" Tinker, who's the bass player, so I can hear myself. Jesus Christ, you've got an amplifier right there. Well, turn it towards you, you know I mean? Like, you know, turn it up, I don't care, but we're not giving you your earphones. Drummers, same thing. So when they came back from Boston, I didn't, I didn't conduct the show to start with because I was doing another show and so I just supervised them. When I came back from Boston and Ox called me up and said, you gotta get over here. So I went over to the Imperial 
the drummer was in a box, completely uh, covered like a, an apartment out of plexiglass. <laughs> uh, the, the, the rhythm section, the rest of the rhythm section was, was, was around him. And then there were strings and whatever. So I took everything out of the pit, all the plus glass, everything, get it all out, all the, all the baffles, everything, out. I put the drummer to the back of the pit, all the way in the back where the brass was. I left the rest of the rhythm section where they were up by me, and I said, okay, let's play. Well, uh, uh, just play. If you can't hear yourself, shut up. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Balance yourself out, and then we'll worry about it. And that's how we played that show in New York. In New York. This is the tough part for me, being a clarinetist in school, you know, I always said, if, if you can't hear the other players, you're playing too loud. And they meant not just the other woodwinds, they meant everybody. And that's sort of, it, it gets lost in a lot of, see, I have this theory about theater. We can't do special effects like television and film, and we just can't do that. We can do really great things but we can't do it like they do. But one thing we can do that they cannot do is that connection between an audience member and a performer. Do you know, between the orchestra and the audience. That, you can't do better than we do that. And when we put more stuff in between that, I think we screw it up. And that's not to say that you should go about Rodgers and Hammerstein as you do Stephen Schwartz, because it's, that the genre are so different. But um, I do think you should try to keep as much natural as you can. I just saw The Color Purple last week, and I thought the sound was really good. But they have to announce that there's a live orchestra. I don't know where it is. I hate that. Um, I, to this day, I didn't look backstage. I wasn't curious about it. But you can't see them. And they say, so-and-so will be conducting the live orchestra. And it's, it's crazy. And you know, this started. So many times I've fought with scenic designers about covering the pit. But you know, directors so much want to have the performers closer to the audience. You know, but we have these things called orchestra pits that we either decide we're going to cover over or we're not going to use. Um, you know, Wicked has an elevator lift, a stair unit, all this other stuff, which is why we had to remote percussion and harp in the Gershwin Theater. Um, we didn't do that in San Francisco. We had the harp boys in the pit. And um, the more, you know, I always remember the first time I ever heard an acoustic guitar in a room, in a little club in, in uh, San Francisco, the Matador, the name of that club. <laughs> Mose Allison played there. This wonderful uh, guitar player would play there on Sunday. I always remember what that sounded like. And when I go into an orchestra pit that's too small, that crams instruments that doesn't give them a chance to breathe, that some stupid set designer, you know, builds the set to here, so you have to like go over the top to see what you're doing. I still try and get them to play in that room. The room meaning the little room that they are in, that they should never be put in in the first place. You know, so that as much as possible the instruments can breathe and they can hear each other. And what then he has to do, and does, is make the audience have that experience. I don't have to do anything. I play my dynamics the way I want to play them so that this orchestra in this room, in that space, is playing the way we would in any space that, that actually allows you to, to hear. Um, and the sound department, you know, I always say to the musicians, don't do their job. Play as you would any place. They'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. You don't have to play loud because you think you're at the back and they can't hear you. Right. You know, the thing at Lincoln Center is always a trap because the pit has, I, I don't know what you'd call them, windows? It's like it, kind of open around the sides. And it's a fairly open, it, it can be more open, but most of the time it isn't. Uh, uh, but when, if it's covered over like it was, say, for frogs, or I don't remember, or it's a part of, uh, I think it was covered over for South Pacific too, but not at the beginning. You can hear you can hear in that in that space because the way it was built, they do have this center thing that that is wish everybody wishes wasn't there. It's the door to get into the pit, but it's, it, it juts into the pit. So you, you're going sort of around the corner things. 
you have all those things to deal with. But still, if you even in, a, in an obscure design like that, if you have the authors to play to themselves, it not only makes his job easier, but then it makes your mind and the music's job easier for you all you to, to deal with, as opposed to immediately going, well, with their, well if you covered over, game over. I can't, I can't talk about that, but I'm talking about if it's at all open and you, know, and you can hear anything that comes out of there. Mm -hmm. Tony, the first time you worked uh, in that room was uh, Anything Goes, right? Right? Well, actually, I was, um, I used to take batteries up there in 1975 <laughs> from the Shakespeare Festival for right. Three Penny Opera. Sure. And then I worked, Kevin Strohmeyer was the, yeah. the electrician at the Beaumont, and I worked for him, and we did Carmen, who was that, uh, Peter, the English director? Yeah, Peter, Peter Brook. Brook. Right. And, but there, there was a sound effect or something. Mm -hmm. But then it was anything goes. But we didn't have the, the pit then. We didn't, I don't know what they, I haven't been back there since Scott's done my yeah, big no, orchestra shows. But we had, anything goes, they were on stage because it was part of the, the oh, good it was part ship, of the scene, shipboard, yeah. Right. And, but uh, it was, um, it was challenging. It's a tough house. It is a tough house. But the tougher part was being a kid with, adult other designers and I mean that in that Tony Walton who I'd worked with so much and I liked so much all of a sudden became this other entity no you can't have foot mics no you can't have I don't want to see any wires no you can't you can't you can't and so I just did what I thought I should do right but uh right. but it was good it, it turned out well and it's such a great show and Patty Lapone is fantastic Still is. Still is. Still is. Well, that took, that went, that covered a lot of ground. I don't know if I have, oh, you know, I wanted to ask, um, Paul, you know, uh, I, the, on the IMDB or I am whatever it is, um, your first credit is sort of listed as being uh, you know, Follies, right? What? So was it? Was it? Follies, well, my first show. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't, but, but it was it the first one. I it, it was the yeah. first one I conducted. Right, but can you tell us a little I, bit about I, uh, your early career? I came to New York uh, off of a ballet gig I was conducting actually, and uh, I was so close to New York because I was living in California, and I had no plans to come here. I mean, it, I was having a perfectly good time in California, but one of my friends, a, a man named uh, an actor named uh, Ed Winter, uh, was in cabaret. And I was in Minneapolis, so I thought, well, I went to Chicago, got on a train, came here. Went to see the show, um, and, and met the musical director, who was Hal Hastings, and he said to me, um, do you have a resume? Well, what do you do? And I told him, and he said, do you have a resume? And I, all classical musicians were told to carry their resumes from school. So I always had one in my pocket. It was stupid, but I did. You couldn't read it very much, because it was sat on for months and months, but I had it anyway. So I gave it to him, and he said to me, uh, uh, you're going back to California? I said, yeah, does, do you have a way back? And I said, I thought he made a bus ticket. Mm -hmm. said, what do you mean? He said, uh, because I have a show, and you maybe could work your way back. That's a good idea. So I got hired as the drummer and the assistant conductor on Cabaret Roadshow with the senior Hasso, and Moss was, was first there. Or Herbert, uh, I don't know. Anyway, a bunch of people. <laughs> and um, I did that for nine months and got a phone call from California saying uh, to Hal Hastings again, Would you, I want you to come back and play Zorba. And I said, look, I don't want to play drums, okay? I'm a conductor. I do not want to play drums anymore. I've done it too long. I don't want to do it anymore. Come back and I'll let you conduct the road show as the musical director. Okay. So I came back. I played Zorba in town. I don't remember how many months, six months later, I was on the road with Cheetah Rivera and John Rady and Zorba. I did that for nine months, and he called me up and said, um, I have a show that if you come back and do, I want you to come back and do it with me, but he said, you'll meet everyone you ever have to read, meet in show business. <laughs> and I said, if it's, this is a drummer's job, forget it. <laughs> and he said, listen, listen to me first. He said, 
this is this is the career move you need to make, and you I don't, and you have to trust me on this." And I said, "Well, who's who? Who am I going to meet?" He said, "Hal Prince." I said, "I already knew him. I did two shows already." But he said, "Yeah, but you don't really know him." I said, "I I know who he is." Okay, really arrogant little shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, then I then he said, well, "Who else?" And I, I said, "Steve Sondheim." I didn't know who that was. I had no clue who that was. Uh, Michael Bennett. Pfft, I still don't know who that is. So I basically said, I'm not coming back to be a conductor, to be a drummer. I'm not doing it. So he said, listen, uh, you're making a mistake. If you do not do what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to fire you. So I hung up the phone. And I called a bunch of musician friends I know around the country. And to a man, they went, are you crazy? <laughs> Yeah. So okay, so I took the job, and then so I got fired. <laughs> and then when he when he 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 opened the show, and then had he had another show called Selling the President, and the guy who had uh, was going to was going to be his assistant was this great big man, violin player named Paul Chianci. He was a classical conductor. Didn't have a clue how to follow a singer, so that happened, and he bombed, and I got the gig. And that the rest is history, as they say. Mm -hmm. Tony, can you talk about your early career? What, what? I was just going to ask, how old were you at that time? Uh, 14, no. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, 14, no. I think I was 28. Right. Right. I was, uh, um, had just changed my major from music to theater at Ithaca College. And my mentor said, you have to go to New York. You can't play in orchestra pits anymore. In the summer, if you're going to do this, there's two places in the world where you can make a living, London and, or New York. He got me an interview at the New York Shakespeare Festival. I ended up getting the job as an electrician. <coughs> Halfway through the summer, the mobile theater was going out, and they needed somebody to run sound effects. And I had worked in a stereo store in high school. And I had more sound experience, therefore, than any other of the starting electricians. And nobody wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'll do it. Their, their fingernails are always cleaner. Was you know? Roger there? Roger, Jay, and yeah. Bill Dreisbach right. were there. And I went back from my senior year at Ithaca with a job waiting for me for the next summer. And it was, um, you know, it's, fun it's funny looking back uh, because that when I, I went back and I got a staff position at, at the public and I did my first musical there. And I was surprised the composer was thrilled that I could read music because at the time I was one of the few sound ops that could read music. And then when I became a designer I was surprised at how many sound designers don't. I mean, younger people get trained for it these days, but. I don't know how many sound designers can't read music, but I can read it really well. He's actually and the first one I've ever worked with that could read music. I mean, now the first t 10 years was Jack Mann. Right. But after that, I can't remember anybody that actually can read music except him. And then I just mixed. I think mixing was <laughs> something that I just loved doing. I just finally didn't love doing it every night. And uh, so I went through all my savings and didn't take any mixing jobs. And you know, by the time Anything Goes came along, that kind of did it. Because up until that point, sound in that theater wasn't very good. And I had some help. John Meyer simmed the room for me. Um, I had experience of sim uh, from Les Mis. And decided that that's what I wanted to do. And I think that was a really big help, having some big guns who really knew a lot more electronically than I did. Um, and I got a lot of work from that show, so. Um, you know, in the collaborative process, I mean, you've already described a lot of what goes on. Um, do you find that you, you have to make compromises and how do you, how do you go about making those compromises? When, you, when what you want to do is at odds with what you want to do, or vice versa? Rarely. I, I, never I find that if, it's yeah. this, if he says he needs to do something, I, just like that story he just told about the guy who said this career <coughs> choice is something you need to do, I know that he needs to do it. Right. Do you know? I, it, yeah. Right. 
Right. It never. We, I just want to say that I don't think we've ever come up against that. Where right. if he said, "Can you tell the accordion player to play the instrument straight, right side up?" I, you know, it's not a problem. <laughs> but well, whatever, whatever he would ask, yeah. because it's it's that's the collect. I mean, that's part of the collaboration. And if he, as I, I feel the same way about him. If he says, "I need this to happen," then he needs it to happen, and it'll, I'll make it happen. Yeah. Right. 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 And one one thing. One of the things that makes it easy, Paul talked about some of the stuff before. I remember once um, the percussionist said, I need six video monitors. And when I told him, he said, no, give him a mirror, one mirror. Because there's only one place where he has to play something that his back is to me. And just give him a mirror. Which, OK. <laughs> Props. <laughs> but um, but uh, I don't. I don't let a lot of monitors go into my pits. It's that thing. Uh, I don't. I, yeah. I don't let like the, when the drummer says uh, he'll. Most of the well, people who work for me know better than to ask. But if they say I need earphones, I always say in the kindest way possible, Why? Why do you need earphones? I need. And it's just a normal thing. I need to hear myself, which is the dumbest thing ever. You get the loudest instrument in the pit. You need to hear yourself. Anyway, uh, or uh, uh, I need to hear the stage. Why do you need to hear the stage? Well, so I can, so you can what? See this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But a lot of these guys doing this like that because it, I will tell you right now, it makes your job a lot easier. Because once they learn the tempos, you can do this and it won't matter. <laughs> I, I don't like to, that's not the way you do a show to me. You're either totally involved or you're at home. I, I don't get the, that, that, oh God, I'm at work <gasps> making 2000 a week, I'm really bored. Uh, excuse me, you know, I just don't get it. So I don't let that happen. In a show where it's really complicated, and I'm trying to think of one, Dream Girls, where I feel it would be to the advantage of all of us if the drummer heard the voice, I'll give him some kind of thing. A monitor, never earphones. Monitor that he can crank it, a voice for himself only, uh -huh. not the rest of the band. <laughs> and and I and I then tell him like I did to Brian in Dreamgirls, which is all the way at the back of the pick. I don't want to ever hear your monitor. Right. So you know it, there is ways. There are way around everything. But again, the the basic thing must be always remembered. The the whatever that is. The, the holy grail must be remembered that, that what you want to do is sit down in the middle of that theater and hear the most glorious sound you've ever right. heard and not think, oh, it's coming out of that speaker. No. If I go, it's coming out of that speaker, then something's wrong. You know, how many times have you gone to the theater where you're sitting in the middle of the house and the trumpets are over here and they're coming out over there? That kind of thing. The minute you hear that, you know that you're in the wrong place. But uh, I think that that Set that's, that mindset about what you want to hear is very important to be clear in your head before you ever walk into any place. I don't mean only in his job, but my job especially. We have different jobs, but we're doing the same thing. Yes. And it's so helpful to me when a performer goes, I can't hear myself, I can't hear myself. And then he'll jump in and go, wait, 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 wait. You know this better than anything. You can't watch me, watch me, watch me. And yeah. you, you know, it, and lots of times you have to use psychology, you know, lots of times, half the time when an actor comes to me and says, can you tell sound to turn me up? I can hear myself. I said, no problem, we'll go right now. I don't do anything. And the next night, how was it? Great. <laughs> you know, play, if, if they, you go back the next night and they say, I, nothing happened, I couldn't hear. Okay, now I'll say something to sound man. Right. But I'm not going to jump the first time somebody says that. They could have an off day. They could have been staying in the wrong spot. They could have, a lot of things could have happened. He could have been having a bad night. Who knows? But but once, if it's said once, I don't I don't listen to it. I mean, they don't know that, but I, I <laughs> your secrets out. I don't really hear. <laughs> I was doing a show once. It was that Sondheim show that you didn't do, and I got a call from the musical director saying the concert master had sat with his wife and seen the show for the first time, and he didn't think the strings were loud enough. <laughs> Sorry. And, the, and the conductor was calling me about this. And I said, well, what did he say about the trumpets? And he said, w what do you mean? I said, well, what do you think he's going to be concerned with? <laughs> what do you, if you put a trumpet player out there, what's a trumpet player going to say? Right. Not enough brass, you know? Right. Come on. 
I always joke with them if they if they go out and see the show, and I encourage it. I say, go out and see the show. Don't don't sit in your little hole and think you know the show. Go out and go out and you know I'll get you a house seat for nothing. Go out and see the show. Usually it's string players and harp players. Usually, harp player will come back and say, you know, I can't hear myself. I said, play louder. See, but I was in a, I said, yeah, well, play louder when you get up there, then you'll hear yourself. What? Never mind. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, I, I don't, I go, well, I sit in this little place, and I hear the orchestra the way I hear it. Now I go out, and now I hear it for the first time the way he hears it. Well, I, have, I can't say anything the first time. I, it's totally a new experience. I don't say anything till the fourth or fifth time I'm out there. And if the thing that bothered me the first time is still bothering me, I'll mention it. I go, is this, you know, the strings sound this way to me. And he'll say, that's because, or he'll say, oh, I didn't hear that. Let me, try, let me listen to that. But never the first time. So here's a musician who knows nothing about what we do. He only knows the, what, the, you know, they're very myopic in that respect. And in a good way, I meant that in a, in a good way. Nobody, nobody anywhere in this room, any place, can be sat, sit where I sit and come out, go out into the house and sit in a seat in the house and go, whoa, that sounds really weird. It certainly does. <laughs> it's totally different than what you ever hear every night. So you have to give yourself, and musicians, so I do tell them that. I said, don't go out there and expect to hear what you hear. Enjoy the experience of the whole show. Don't concentrate on your part or the band. Just see what you think overall. Studio 54 is great because you can send them out and it sounds great any place you sit. So right. it's not a big deal, but in a theater it can be a problem. Right. I mean, a, a, while you go into the pit. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about orchestrations and how they've changed um, as time has passed? Uh, sure. Um, and then we should open up questions. Yeah, which I, I plan to after this. The, I, I was to just saying Paul this morning, you know, I do this, uh, I do this seminar and I do it for non-sound people. And I get two singers, put three microphones on them, one here, one here, one here, and a, pian a pianist. And the very first thing I have them do is sing eight bars of the same song using the three different mic positions and letting the audience see how different they sound. We do a lot of different things in this seminar too. We, we put vocals in the stage monitors and turn them up until it first sounds like a tunnel and then it feeds back and lots of things and also moving hands over you know microphones and stuff. But um, <laughs> the uh, that I, use, I talk a little bit about orchestrations, and I always use the song Some People from Gypsy, because I think it's a really good example of writing for lyric. Um, if you're familiar with Gypsy, it's some people can get a thrill, knitting sweaters and sitting still. And during the some people, it's can get a thrill. That's okay for some people. And it just leaves room for all these really difficult lyrics. They're sung really fast. And when she gets into the um, bridge, all the places I have to be here. And there's just a downbeat on the first bar of each measure and um, so you get all this lovely orchestration when she's either not singing or when she's sustaining when she gets into but I I guess that's the bridge but I da -da 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 -da. at least gotta try da -da 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 -da. And I, I know because I played read one in the pit a long time ago <laughs> for this but and was fascinated by how <clears throat> you get this incredibly big sound yet you hear the words, too. Um, and that just gets farther and farther and farther and farther away from my experience. Um, it's a, it started with keyboards, when keyboards could replicate other instruments. And I find that orchestrators over-orchestrate so much now and just pile stuff on top. There was a show a few years ago that um, a good friend of mine orchestrated, and I. It didn't last long, and it's not 
because of the orchestrations, but it was just full all the time. And it's not exciting when it's like that. It's, it's not exciting to be loud. The difference between being soft and being loud is exciting. And if you don't get to pianissimo, then fortissimo isn't loud enough. So if you're at mezzo forte all the time, then you have to go too loud to get to make it exciting. And I think orchestrations have a lot to do with that. Moving lights do as well, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. Puccini never wrote for more than 35 musicians. That'll give you an idea what they've done at the Met. All of his operas are scored for 35 musicians. And when you hear it that way, when you hear the original orchestration played like you do in Italy a lot of times, and there used to be a guy here, Anton Coppola, he's too old now, he used to do it at Stanford Opera. A crescendo means something. Forte means something. Piano means something. When you get 200 people playing, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, Virginia, but you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just too much. It's overblown. That's why when we do th musical theater at, the, say, the Philharmonic or in our, our symphony orchestra, I always say, please do not give me 70 strings. It, it, it way overblows the orchestration. They don't get it. So I spend the entire evening going too loud, too loud, less. If you've got a dynamic marking above the piano, you're wrong. Because there's 70 strings where there used to be six. Right. So, I mean, it just makes no sense. And the only other thing I would add to what Tony said, the way orchestration has changed the most is the orchestrators have gotten so paranoid, not all, but some, most, have gotten so paranoid about their jobs and what they're going to get criticized is they do what he says. They just fill the page with music. Uh, um, 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 what's the American in Paris is a perfect example. You got 15, 18 players trying to be 100. So you, here's the disadvantage. A trumpet player never puts down his horn all night. Violin never puts down her violin all night. Then never ever gets to rest. There is no nuance because everybody's playing all the time. Because they're trying to emulate the 100 piece orchestra that played the movie. The dumbest, because it was not a very good orchestrator, I have to say. Uh, it's not his fault. He's not experienced in doing the theater. He's a ballet guy. So I, but it doesn't matter. The other, I mean, there are beautifully tasteful orchestrations, and I will tell you one right now. It happens to be my show, but I don't mean to say it because it is. I wish it wasn't that I could talk about it even more. But Larry Hockman and I sat down, and we, we, we decided that we would do a, for this show because it's a little European type show, we would decide we would do a, 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 um, a sort of a, a, a European chamber orchestra. There are no doubles in the, in, the, in the woodwind section. There's one alto sax, one place, but it's, it's legit flute, legit oboe, English horn, legit clarinet, legit bass clarinet, and bassoon, harp, trumpet, uh, French horn, string quartet, it could be more, it was more for the record because we can't get more strings in there. And uh, uh, keyboard, real accordion, drums, and bass. So in numbers, there are times when the drums aren't even playing. There are times when the strings aren't playing and, it, and, and it's the woodwinds that are playing. There are times when a clarinet, a violin, a viola, and a cello are playing. That's it. So what happens is when we get loud, it sounds big. Well, how big can 14 players play? You know, with that, that's a that's a light band. That's no nobody can go boom except for the drummer. <laughs> you know, so it's 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 a matter of again servicing what the score is and how it be and, and taking a chance on, on <coughs> making making a musical choice as opposed to what you think somebody may want. There, there is a whole school of orchestration and has been around way too long. Phil Lang, um, this is the guy who used to write for Candor, that's not with us anymore. Uh, uh, oh, um, yeah. yeah. <sighs> he guy did anything goes. The guy, guy that did most of John Candor's stuff. You would get a score from him and every player would be playing the whole number. And you'd say, well, 
what? I don't understand this. He said, oh, no, we'll make, you make your choices. No, 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 no. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> but it would, actually, it would actually be like that. Every number. And that way, he could never be wrong. And it's a protection device. And it's not very artistic. The other way I think they've changed is we used to orchestrate for 27. We are now orchestrating for 8 to 14. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And another, just I'm just if anybody's interested in orchestrations, I think Men of La Mancha, mm -hmm. their original orchestration is really fantastic. Absolutely. And there's not even a keyboard. The the there's two uh, Spanish guitars, yep. and it's just and no doubles except for four no. piccolo. There's a recording if you can want to hear a good one. I'm not saying that because I conducted it, but it is with uh, with um, Placido Domingo and uh, Mandy and. I'm trying to remember the soprano from the West Coast who played. Anyway, Julie the orchestra is what? Julie McGinnis. Yeah, Julie McGinnis. Uh, absolutely, the orchestra absolutely is exquisite on that album. And it's, it's a brass section, uh, two Spanish guitars, drums. No, three drum, uh, percussionists. Oh, that's right. Toys, timpani player, and a little kit. That's right. And it's it's. A delicious orchestration. Yeah, really it was. And it's very difficult to realize that because it was done by committee. That show. There's no um, orchestrator in. The no, there's no orchestrator. Listed. It was yeah. done by by Mitch Lee's uh, commercial department. You know, everybody <laughs> everybody wrote a different song. Everybody. They did it well. I yeah, did. That was. It's a fantastic orchestration. I agree with you. I'd like to open it up to questions. Can I? I would love to know. If how much you oh, let's get you a mic because we we got to pass the talking stick around. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How much do you appreciate going to the musicians' rehearsals? Or I mean, did you ever sit down together and look at the orchestrations written out before even setting foot into a theater? When I'm working with him, he tells me in advance where I'm going to have trouble. Uh, I, I usually go and listen. I usually, if we have stuff, anything to set up, like we recently did a show where the composer, lyricist, orchestrator was a little um, crazy about only having a quartet, right. remember? Right. So we brought doubling stuff for strings into the rehearsal studio. But if I have time and I don't have to be in the theater, I love to sit through an orchestra rehearsal. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing. And he gets to set a score if he wants to. Yeah. I mean, real scores. Yeah, not, real not, full not, scores. Not, not, not sound man scores. Real right. scores. Right. Yeah. And not did, PVs. Now, That's right. And do you, how much of like balanced control between the two of you as far as uh, the actual arrangement of the musicians in the pit orchestra? We, we discussed that from day one. I say, this is what I think will work in this space. And he'll say, well, do we have to put the drums there? And I go, well, where do you want to put the drums? And he says, over there. And so we put them over there. It's like that. It's, it's collaborated. But we do use all that time when they're mucking around with lights and everything else to, you know, I spend time in the pit or wherever. Yeah, and we, said, we, we pretty much, as, as I said, even if it's a pit, we would set it up way in advance so that, that we knew exactly what. And as far as... Uh, as far as dynamics or nuance and that stuff, I, 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 I've already said to you, I start as if we were a live thing. And if he says to me, I cannot, for the life of me, find the cello, then I say play louder. But, but you know, or if he gives me a note like the strings are digging in too much, I give them a note on that level. But usually it's after we've heard the orchestration, because they're new to us too. And even though you are an excellent reader, uh, which I am, and so is he, until you hear it, these are the most valuable things that I have as a musician. I mean, my I, my eyes, my education, all that's fine. These are still my, this, this, these tell me everything, make every decision for me. I don't make a decision on, a, on, a, on any other way. If I hear it and it, it looks on the page one way and it hears a different, this is what I go with, always. Um, yeah. Uh, Whoa, hello, Mike. Yeah. I was about to talk about transparency, but maybe I'll <laughs> No, no, it's interesting to hear your talks about orchestration, cause, because, because seriously, I, I think what you're really talking about is, in the best sense, transparency in the sound of an orchestra. In other words, you hear 
everything clearly because not everything's blocking Absolutely. your way, you know? Yep. And th this is somewhat anecdotal, but, but the first time I really experienced something that is a real problem against that is there was some show at the Globe, and I, Old Globe in San Diego, I don't remember which one it was, but it was clear that the opening chord of the show was like four synthesizers playing fortissimo. And it's a not a genuine fortissimo. It's because it's this, you know, that's the only thing that's acoustically loud is that. That doesn't, that's interesting, but it's not, you know, a genuine fortissimo. That's just an interesting table hit. Um, and, and then you're kind of pushing air through speakers, but it's not real, in, but there's no real acoustic sound that's coming at you loud. You know, and whatever might have been there doubling it is kind of buried underneath these four synthesizers playing loud. So it's, and because that's a solution, so to speak, of contemporary orchestration in theater, it's, it's a problem that just kind of doesn't really go away unless you can find a way around it. What I was going to say, fortunately, you know, because I, you don't know this, but I, but I, I work with Randy Newman a lot, and, and I've done his theater orchestrations, and so what I've tried to do to make him sound as good as, because he, he's, a, he's an orchestral thinker, yeah. along with his piano. Yeah. And so, I, although there are times when the synthesizer strings show up, but there's always a real violinist, a real reed player, and a real trombone player to try to mirror his orchestra around his piano, so you're never hearing, be, because his sound as an orchestrator is so interestingly transparent. But there's always it's always it's always piano bass. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and, yeah, it's and like it, his, like his records are right. Yeah. I mean, and that that's him as a composer. So that's his aesthetic, yeah, which yeah. is which is great. Because the other thing that 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 always occurs to me, and when you talk about how Man of La Mancha is finally there's no keyboard there, the the other thing is when you, when you write for strings on a keyboard, you're basically writing for a keyboard, and so the, the limitation of that is that it sounds very blocky. It, it doesn't sound like the way you would orchestrate for strings, which is... Unless you add real instruments. What I mean by right, that is, right, if, you know, we, we sent Jerome Robbins out of the road and they wouldn't pay for the whole orchestra. Right. And what I did was I, took a, I sent out a real violin, a real cello, and a real viola. Right. And we never... Over in other words, they were never over the real violin. If I was sitting in the house, I only heard, I heard the first. I don't know how to explain this. I, I heard the the real instruments first. I heard them first, right. and then so, the hammer. So, so it didn't matter that, that that this sounded like a bad accordion or whatever. Right. The, right. The, so it didn't matter. But if, I agree with you totally. If you if you just have synthesizers, it's you better just do piano bass and drums because it, it's it, you can't like get any. There's no color. There's no nuance. There's as you say, you do that, and that's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Scott. Uh, let's pass him the mic, just for the folks out there. Um, I, I'm just curious, Paul. Um, a lot of the things that you do as uh, kind of ways of controlling the situation sound like they come out of your experience from uh, the days before we had a lot of technical, I'll use the word, solutions to problems that, like, singers hearing themselves, orchestral balance, uh, all these things that, you know, before we had all kinds of technology, well, we, yeah. you, had, you had to solve all those problems, which makes our job, I mean, when, when we go with your kind of solutions, um, our job as sound designers becomes so much easier. Well, because, you know, I thank you for that. And yes, I was there when they had. They, I was. At, I came in in 1969 when they were just starting to have radio mics. In fact, I spoke with Jack Mann. We were in 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 uh, where the hell are we? At, at New Haven with Zorba. We kept getting cab because that was one of the first shows that ever used radio. Mics. Kept getting, and they were like this. They were that big, you know. Big, and the antennas were this. Right, right. Yeah, and they, and they, and they, and they, you would get cap calls on on the, um, yeah. uh, on the, um, the oh yeah, we to get you know in the house. At the so Dome. he went up on the top of the Schubert Theater with about two hundred rolls of tin foil and made a tin foil thing all the way around the top, <laughs> and they basically stopped. <laughs> but anyway, I, I the reason why that is is again, I think it's coming from. 
classical world of singers. I think that's the reason why. Because if you understand the voice and understand what they hear when they sing, when somebody comes to me and says, I can't hear myself, you know, or, or I, I'm too, I care too much of my, whatever. The first thing that, that a lot of people did in the old days and didn't know to do is start with them off. I can't hear the orchestra is my favorite thing. Now, at Studio 54, I just look at them if they say that, because the orchestra is in their face. But if it's in a pit, I can understand they've been hearing some rehearsal pianists bang the living crap out of a piano for four weeks. You know, with probably nowadays, I notice you go in and they have mics on it. You go, we're in a room this size, you have mics on the piano? Yeah, well, you can't hear. Really? Okay, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, so I, what I would do is I would say, turn everything off. I would play. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, then I don't understand because we were on. Okay, so then I'd say to whoever the sound guy was, bring up the, uh, whatever you're playing on stage. But don't go to the number. Just bring it up. Okay. So they bring it up to like the quarter, a little bit more. And right about there, they'd say, oh, no, that's good. And they weren't even near the mark they were at before. They didn't know what to listen for. So. As much as we know, understand the technology, you have to remember that these are actors. They don't understand diddly squat unless you tell them. <laughs> Lots of them are very experienced, like Patty, for instance. Right. She knows. There are many that do. In my show, Jane Kowalski knows. Laura is a soprano. She doesn't really know that much about what the mic does. So when she thinks she can't hear herself, it would never occur to her that she's singing too loud. So you have to finesse that a little bit. And you also have to deal with the orchestration dynamic. And it, it is a little easier for me too now that the technology is what it is. Because before feedback, the foot mics, we were always getting notes about you're going to the foot mics. Well, how, how am I supposed to, they're right there. How am I supposed to not go into the foot mics? I mean, I'm in a pit. I don't know how to not go into the foot mics. And eventually they went away and it wasn't a problem, but, but you know, it, 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 it wasn't sort of evolved. Well, there's so few musical directors who get into that to the degree that you're talking about, where we're up there on stage talking to actors about, you know, how they can hear themselves better, and it's, we're really kind of floating free there. I hate to it's, say this, they don't know, that's it's, why. This is the part that makes it such a pleasure to work with Mr. Giuliani, <coughs> because what we do is so father. subjective and so arcane, and half the time people think we're trying to pull something over on them because you can't see it. You can't see the level that the microphone is. The light's on, and they're in it. That piece of scenery came to its mark where it's supposed to, and the props are there. But who's, who else is there to help you go, no, the level's right? It, it no, the to, orchestra is fine on stage. It has, to be, it has to be the musical director, and if be, he doesn't know anything about the voice, you're screwed. Actually and it's and he validates us. Or if he's us. afraid, if he's afraid to do his job. I mean, I, I tell you one story about that. When we went to Carnegie Hall with the first Sondheim thing, you know, there were five thousand. The first Sondheim thing that Scott Ellis directed, uh, it was called the Sondheim Celebration or something. And Liza was on it. And and I came. I uh, we had a sound meeting. I don't remember. I think it was the Carnegie Hall people, but I don't remember. There's might have been somebody else back there. I don't remember who that was. And they said, "Do you? Uh, we're going to put wedges up." I said, "Why are you putting wedges up? So they can hear themselves. Do we have to start with them?" I said, "Just put them there and don't turn them on." Okay. And don't put twelve of them. Put where the microphones are. Don't put them you know, like across the stage like a rock concert. So we get there and. Um, Liza comes in. Nobody says anything. They're not on all day. Nobody says a word. No singer ever says, I, uh, hello, is there a not, not, no. Because in Carnegie Hall, if you listen, you can hear. It's not great since they fixed it. But <laughs> it's, it's okay. So uh, she says, uh, Liza comes on. And, hi, honey, hi, honey. And she starts to sing, you know, full out. The brass section blows her right off the stage. She's singing crazy. Okay. I can't hear myself. So I said to the trumpets, back off. Just let's lower everything down a little bit. Oh, why don't I take any energy out? It won't be any energy out. Like, just listen. And we did. New York, New York, she was singing. And why she was singing, I don't know, because it's not my program. 
Um, <laughs> but she did. <laughs> I didn't choose the material. Uh, so anyway, so she's singing it, and uh, we, uh, I think it was supposed to be an encore uh, for her, personally. So um, we get to, uh, we get halfway through it, and she says, that's, that's better, that's better. But I still can't hear myself. And I said, okay, well, let's uh, turn her mic up, I said. Fully well knowing that they're not going to do anything. And we start again, and she says, fine. It wasn't until her stupid piano player said, you know, the wedges aren't on, Eliza, that we, ever, we got caught. And we had to turn them on. So we only turned them on for her, but I just, that's the story I thought I'd tell you. Uh, Tony, when you say, say for instance, Wicked, and, and you're not working with Paul, you're working with a, a different kind of music director, I, I don't know who it was, but and in a very different kind of musical than what's been described. How do you take your philosophy of transparency and authenticity of instruments and bring it into a production like that? Well, the, first of all, it's Stephen Schwartz. And um, he has a really great idea of what he wants. The problem comes after Stephen, and it's what other people want, like the choreographer and uh, other people. But Stephen doesn't, you know, the original concept of the show, and that's why they hired Bill Brown to orchestrate it, was there was this orchestra with this little combo band in the middle of it. And they decided to change the concept between San Francisco and New York to the opposite of that with the same orchestration. I mean, it's a big, there's 24 people in the pit there. And um, I think if you go to the Gershwin and you sit in the eighth or 10th or 12th row, you will have that experience. On the road, I try, I try, I try, I try, I try. Do you know, I have a vocal system, I have an orchestra system. I bleed a little bit of either end to both, but mostly the vocals come from here, the orchestra comes from here. And uh, then I don't go out for a while, and a year later I come out and the vocals are all over. You know, completely all over. Everything's coming out of everywhere. And then I have to dial it back. But it, it's just harder. It, it is just harder to do. Um, and a lot of times, it's, you said earlier, Scott, the, the old days. The old days, the musical director was in charge. Mm -hmm. Do you know what happens these days is they're afraid of the cellist. Do you know? They're afraid to tell the trumpets to blow softer. Do you know? They're afraid to tell the orchestrator he's over-orchestrated. Especially if it's I, I a, threw an orchestration out and she loves me that somebody else had done because Larry didn't think, I won't tell you who did it. Larry didn't think he had enough time to finish it and I threw it out because, first of all, five measures that I knew he didn't write it because it's one of those guys that writes everything, everybody playing, so you can make your choices. Um, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people here know that orchestrators often farm stuff out if they're, oh, if they're sometimes busy. Sometimes when they get nervous, you know, like they, he, this, this, I'll give you an idea how much music there's in She Loves Me. A normal musical has tops 26 cues. This has 56 cues. Wow. Okay? We never, we never stop playing. Uh, it's either doorbells or music, whatever, one or the other. Uh, so it's a lot of doorbells. Sometimes both, right? But, mu but musical, musical, musical doorbells. doorbells. Not, not, oh, not sound, it. musical yeah. doorbells. Um, written into the score. Uh, anyway, uh, I threw it out. And Larry's orchestrated a long time. He turned white. He said, what am I going to tell him? I said, tell him that it sucked. Tell him that I don't like it. Tell him it's too much. Tell him he didn't listen to the rehearsal tape. I said, do you want me to tell him? I'll tell him. And let him and let him fix it if he wants, but I don't think he can because uh, he's I don't his orchestrations are nowhere near as inside and warm and funny and genuine as yours are. That's exactly what I said to him. So he went away and did a brilliant orchestration. So uh, two weeks later, the guy comes to the show <laughs> and his orchestration isn't in, and he comes and start to yell at me, and I said, "Well, I didn't like it," and he said, "Well, how, how come?" How come? I said, well, the composer's dead, so I'm the boss. <laughs> what exactly is that job? So I said, if Jerry Bach had heard this, he would have thrown it out. And I, we can't prove that, but we don't have to. 
I said, but you got paid for it, and you know, and I was trying to be kind to him. I said, you know, everybody, you know, you were thrown in the orchestration. I totally understand it. I, I just needed another thing, and, and you know, I could have gone to you, but Larry was standing there, and he did the rest of the show, and he didn't have everything else to do. That's why I went it that way. And he took it, but I was saying that story to, to say that none of these guys think, they don't think they're in charge, and they don't get talked to like they're in charge. And they are so afraid they're going to get fired because they're treated like crap most of the time. Almost like as bad as a sound person. Right. Almost. You know, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you, if you don't speak up for what you believe in, you might as well go work for UPS because you're going to be angry and crotchety and start not doing your gig the way you really want to do it and what made you do it in the first place. Very important. Very important. I don't think you ever can let up. As long as you decide to do that, or do this business, whatever job it is, if you don't do it the way, that, if you don't do it from the place that made you do it in the first place, then you're, you're not doing it. And that's, I'm not trying to be a big mouth, or I'm not trying to be a boss. I'm trying to get what I think is right done. And if they don't do it, which nobody's asked, nobody's ever asked what happens when they say no, then I don't do it. I'm not ultimately the boss. So if, the, if, the, if, if I ask for something, and I ha there has been times on shows when I've said, everything's too fucking loud. Turn it all down. No. Okay. I can't do anything about it now. Right. Yeah, I guess I have a question about that. Um, that there, there seems, the, these days again, it's part of like the, the, the amount of power that most music directors feel they don't have versus the power of the director. And Tony can really respond to this as well. Like, I find a lot of times the director is telling me, asking me for things that mm -hmm. I don't think are right musically, but mm -hmm. they feel like it adds to the energy of the show. And I know that the, the orchestrator, musical director, composer, if they were if they were in the room, would have really strong opinions about it, but might be scared of of the director. And I'm putting this here having to bring up stuff to a level that doesn't feel the right be, to me. The best argument or best answer to that, from my point of view, and he might have more than I do, Michael Bennett. If Michael Bennett's ears were not bleeding, the show was not loud enough. I could tell from the orchestra pit when he came in in Dreamgirls. Because we'd be cooking along, everything fine, and all of a sudden I'd hear the entire show behind me. <laughs> and I go, oh, Michael's here. <laughs> and so the sound people and I made a deal. Do whatever, because you can't, he's, he's paying your salary, what are you going to do? <laughs> if, he, if he doesn't get it, then he doesn't get it. You're not, you can't force somebody to understand something. So I, I argued and argued and argued, and he'd go, uh-huh, 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 and every time he came come in, whoop, everything went up. Right? So what would happen is, when he was there, everything was up, and the minute he walked out the door, everything came back down again. <laughs> Well, I remember a story, uh, I think Jack Mann told it. He, he said in the old days when they had, when things were reinforced with foot mics and other things like that, that essentially there were two marks on the, on the sure. master volume. One that, was for the show and the other was for when the director was That's there. correct. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's correct. Uh, could you and most directors have a little more taste of that. And the older I have gotten, the more directors will listen to me because I have a special sentence I say. You can play it that way if you want, but it's way too loud, and I can see the people in the audience going like this. Right. I always say that to them, whether it's true or not, I say it. And then they listen, but a younger person say that, and they go, right, kid, go away. Because it happened to me. That used to happen to me all the time. I go, that's too loud. What do you know? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's something uh, to look forward to when you get older. You can, right. you can start to do some of that stuff. Well, you know all this stuff. You know all the politics, but you know, you just, you know, I, I sort of take it to the bottom line, as Paul just said about Michael Bennett. Stephen Schwartz hired me to do Wicked, really. So when I'm in a situation between the choreographer and he wanting different things, uh -huh. I do what he wants. Mm -hmm. And now I have to put up with the choreographer then, too. And it was, <laughs> Stephen hadn't been around. We were previews in New York. and. Every night we got notes about drums being louder, 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 louder. And then Schwartz came to see the show and- Drums too loud. Drums too loud here, drums too loud here. And about the sixth note I said, 
this isn't the way I want it. These are all notes from the choreographer. And then it was, well, tell the choreographer the next time he has a note for you that he needs to give it to me, and I'll decide if I give it to you. So that night, of course, and I told the choreographer this, and he threw his jacket down on the floor and left um, in a fit. And the whole sound department walked over his jacket to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about the 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 use of uh, untrained leads now in, in musicals versus <laughs> how, how do you maybe mean trained that? chorus members. What do you mean untrained? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, you're Tony. In 1983, I did a show called My One and Only, huh. and the stars were Tommy Tune and Twiggy. Yes. <laughs> And there was an orca, 27-piece orchestra with two pianos at the center of it. And our original director was Peter Sellars, the opera director who didn't want sound. <laughs> he would go into, you know, Tommy likes to rehearse in theaters. They, we rehearsed in the St. James before we went to Boston. Two pianos, Wally Harper, brilliant piano orchestrations, wow. just brilliant. But you couldn't hear Tommy or Twiggy over the two pianos. And Ott and I were, what do they think is going to happen when we add 25 people? They're going to get loud? Those two are going to get louder? So that, I've had this for many, that was 1983. And, uh, you know, put the microphone here, if you can. It, but yet you'd have to deal with that all the time. When I did Shogun the Musical, they had to put, before they hired the woman who played the lead, they had to put a microphone on her because they couldn't hear her in the audition wherever they auditioned and when they stopped paying for a crew to be in during previews the director had to bring a chair up onto the stage because literally she sang about this loud now this goes back to musical directors not knowing what the fuck they're doing or being afraid because where where that could be stopped is in the auditions if you say People know me well enough in auditions now to know to ask me, is, can this person sing it? Rarely do I say no, even if they can't sing well, because I know that I can get them through the show. Um, and I'll talk about that little trick in a minute. But you have to speak up. You have to speak up. You guys are screwed because you don't ever get into that. But that's where it starts. So let's say somebody hires somebody that can't sing, or somebody that has a reputation to sing, like Cindy Lover, and now you have to have her sing in front of an orchestra. That's a real challenge, because she can't sing. Madonna can't sing unless she's recorded. Okay, you have those people, but let, uh, let's go back to untrained actors. <clears throat> you have to say to the director and the choreographer in the in the audition, they can't sing at all. Well, can't they? No, not at all. It's a disaster. You can't. They, they'll never get through the songs, much less eight shows a week. You have to make it that strong, if you believe that. If they don't believe you, I'm done. So when I'm playing and they say play softer because I can't hear the singer and she's singing a half tone flat and nobody hears it but me. I don't, there's nothing I can do. That's never happened, but I'm saying I know it can. The other positive part is you never tell a, a weak singer that they can't sing. You never tell them that. You never say anything. You, as far as you're concerned, they're Beverly Hills. And, with, and by giving them confidence and giving them tricks like don't, don't, sing, don't sing any louder than you can. Don't try and fill the house. And then you go to him and you say, this is a real problem. You're going to have to help here. <laughs> right? But there are, but if you, it starts way before that. And if it, if it doesn't start way before that, it makes all of our jobs impossible. I can't, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. Alexis Smith in Follies. She didn't get to sing. But she sang enough. So it was able to be able to work it out. Uh, there was one other I thought that was worse than that. Um, 
the, the little girl that was in Assassins, I don't remember her name, Mary Catherine something or other, couldn't sing at all. And um, by, by, by talking to her about the song as an acting device, I was able to get her to use her voice, whatever that was, as much of it as it was. Because most of the people in the theater that can't sing think that the first thing they want to do is like sing as loud as they possibly can because they have to fill a house. If you back all of that off and get down to what they would do if they were just playing a guitar for themselves, you might find something in there that you could actually use. And then, and then give them the confidence that that's, that's where you have to do it. Sing it there. Not because you can't sing, but that's because what the song is. That's what the song's about. The song doesn't require you to, you know, bring the audience to you. Don't go to the audience. That kind of garbage. <laughs> well, it's not garbage, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. That kind of thing. So that you get, yeah, so that you can get through the, to them. Because I, I, very few have I come up against where I thought, I think there's one in, in, in all the shows I've done, one or two people that I've gone to and say, mouth the words in, this, uh, in the chorus numbers. What? Mouth the words. Most of the time there have been dancers who were there for a reason other re than, than singing, but, but of course they want them in the ensemble numbers. So you just say, mouth the words, you don't have to sing, don't worry about it, it's not a problem. We've got all these other people singing, and they do. And they're fine with it. I uh, find that when I do sweetening sessions, where we are sweetening a number because everybody's been dancing for 20 minutes, that sometimes I have to record singers in shifts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the good shift and the shift that we aren't going to actually right. 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 That's right. They do that all, they used to do that all the time in movies before Pro Tools. There's a, there's a movie which I won't mention that I did, which I hope nobody ever sees. Uh, uh, where I took one, there's seven women in the opening number. I took one woman and replaced every one of those seven women with that one woman. Mm -hmm. right. I'm mimicking the voice of those people. <laughs> yeah. Because none of them could sing. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, Rob. Um. Paul, how, uh, with the performers, say like Patti Lapone or someone like that, do you get into it with them about interpretation of, of songs? Do you, how, how involved, or, or with someone who maybe, maybe that's well, too uh, extreme it, it, a case? You know, well, she and I did Gypsy together, not here, but the original. I mean, when we did it originally in Ravinia, which is which, where that production came from. And um, yeah, yeah, I would say stuff to her about what I thought if she didn't, wasn't there yet. But the thing about Patty is, I, my, my deal is, if somebody's got it, or an interpretation of something, and it's believable, and it's within the thing, then I shut up. If they ask for my help, I, I talk about it. If it's a kid, or if it's in the movies where it has to be done quickly, yes, I talk a lot more about the song. But in, in somebody like Patty, there's not much you need to tell her. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I, and it's not, and she'll, she's a, she's a, 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 a she'll, she'll take anything from you. Uh, Contrary to popular opinion. She's fantastic. Yeah. She's really she, she, smart. She, she's smart and she, but 90% of the time it's like, you know, just painting the edge of that window, you know. It, just saying, you know what, if you weren't so loud in the first chorus, you, oh, that's a good idea, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, rarely have I mentioned a lyric to her about how she's interpreting it, but I have, you know. When you, and it also depends on the quality. I gave her a lot more notes than Evita because that's a piece of shit. And you have to like work your ass off just to make it so that people don't walk out of the theater. That's, not, that's my opinion. But you know, I had, to, I had to conduct that thing for almost two years and I thought, oh my god, I, I, I can't make this music into anything. And that's what it feels like when you play it. It's so banal to play. It may not sound that way, but it's so banal to play and so hard to play because it's so fussy and you know just weird that that you you leave the orchestra pit going, God, I, 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 did, I didn't accomplish anything. That's what exactly what it feels like. The performers feel that way too. So there was a lot more talk in a show like that where you have to work to to elevate the material uh, itself. As opposed to, say, his, one of his other shows, Jesus Christ Superstar, which is fantastic. You don't have to do that at all. Anyway, yes, 
anybody, anybody, anytime. If you don't say what you want to say, as I've said before, to the performer you're working with, then you're making a mistake. You're not doing your job. You don't have to be mean and ugly about it, but I mean, you, if you have a feeling about it. Uh, and it's the same yeah. thing with volume levels, which you mentioned earlier. You need to, as a sound designer, stay on the actors about this. Yep. Do you know and say and explain it. I was doing two shows at once, and one was The King and I, and Donna Murphy was the lead. And she's she can sing, but she has a tendency to speak yeah, quietly. She, she, she and I on. would come up, because I was doing that other Sondheim show down the street, and I would come up and I'd say, I can't hear her, hear, 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 hear. Nobody was talking to her. So finally, the, one night I came up and I said it to the director, and he said, well, you go tell her, I'm tired of talking to her. So I went in at half hour, and I said, you know, Donna, there are places in the show where I can't hear you. And I said, what happens is, if I, if I could make the microphone loud enough, all of a sudden you're coming from somewhere else and everybody else on stage is coming from them. And she was horrified to hear that she couldn't be heard yeah, no, and asked for absolute specific yeah. lines. So that's what I do every night. When I finally got up there full time, every night I gave her every single line and I couldn't hear. But it's time. You have to take the time to write yes, down and the lines. You have to, and and then, you, have to have, you have to have the balls to walk in the room. That's it. That's right. You can't, these are, these are people, they, most, uh, the worst, the worst people that, that have the worst reputations, Betty Buckley, I have never, ever had her scream at me for a note. You go, and I mean, I worked with her a lot younger than I am now. And you go in and you say, I don't understand, what, what, what are you doing here? And she'll tell you. And you'll say, I, I don't get it, because I hear it this way. Oh, totally contrary to her reputation. So if you're a little young musical director and you have Betty Buckley as the star, I can understand your trepidation, but you have to, or a sound person, you have to go in there and tell them the truth, that's your gig. That is your gig, and you do it. Right. And if they say, get the hell out of my dressing room, then that's what happens. And most of the time, if you're honest, they'll respond and, positively. And honest, sincere, and, and have their, their interest. best interest at heart, right. they will do nothing but be nice to you. Liza Minnelli, yep. um, Elaine Page, Patti Lapone, Stritch. All, <laughs> all, all of them. <laughs> All of them were told. I was told were horror stories, and I had nothing but me neither. All those pleasurable all those horror times stories. Today. I've never had any trouble with. Adina Menzel, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Yep. But they all have one thing in common. They're all smart, and they know if you're trying to pull, they pull know something if over. If you're on not them. smart, they know if you're trying to throw your weight around. They know if you're stupid. They know if you don't know what you're talking about. Right. So don't don't try and shine them on because they're too smart for that. But telling the truth is not a problem. I don't think, or it never has been so far. Oh, this metal, well, I went out. Abe once said that being a sound designer is trying to keep all the balls in the air without losing your own. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty yeah, good. That's a general thing. Like it doesn't that. apply to all I of like us that. in this that's room. Very, that's yeah. very good. Yeah. Abe Jacobs. Abe Jacobs was the sound designer on Evita. Yeah. Any other questions? OK. OK. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I played. I played with my microphone.